Dr. John Medina, he's a genetic engineer from University of Washington, states this. The average human heart pumps over 1,000 gallons a day, over 55 million gallons in a lifetime. This is enough to fulfill, to fill 13 super tankers. It never sleeps. The heart, right? The heart never sleeps. Beating 2.5 million times in a lifetime. The lungs contain 1,000 miles of capillaries. The process of exchanging oxygen for carbon dioxide is so complicated that it is more difficult to exchange O for CO than for a man shot out of a cannon to carve the Lord's Prayer on the head of a pin as he passes by. So think of the probability there. Our DNA. The DNA contains about 2,000 genes of chromosome. 1.8 meters of DNA are folded into each cell nucleus. A nucleus is 6 micro, microns long. This is like putting 30 miles of fishing line into a cherry pit. And it isn't simply stuffed in. It is folded in. It is folded one way. The cell becomes the skin cell. If it's folded one way, the scale becomes a skin cell. In another way, the liver cell, and so forth. To write out the information in one cell would take 300 volumes. Each volume 500 pages thick. The human body contains enough DNA that if it were stretched out, it would circle the sun 260 times. The body uses energy efficiently. If an average adult rides a bike for one hour at 10 miles per hour, it uses the amount of energy contained in three ounces of carbohydrate. If a car were this efficient with gasoline, it would get 900 miles per gallon. Did we get here by chance? I thought we were like a freak accident. The human body so well designed, so well crafted, just came out of nowhere. What do you think, my brothers and sisters, this morning? As I read this medical literature to you, do you really think we came by accident? If you look at our body, the complexity of our body, the intelligent design, the efficiency, it all points out to an intelligent designer, a creator, a god. In fact, the Bible declares that we are fearfully and wonderfully knit together. God knew you while, still, while you were still in your mother's womb. He wonderfully knit you. And the God of our Bible tells us that he knows when you lie down, when you wake up. He knows the number of hair on your head. He knows the details of your life and my life. Book of Romans declares that God's invisible attributes, His divine power, His divine nature are displayed for all creation to see. I only read to you a small portion of what a human body is made of. But if we look at creation, there's evidences of His existence right around us. Today, my friends, we are going to look at the human body and the Bible. You can open up with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting at verse 12, 12 to 27. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. For you have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. 15. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? 
as we read this, my friends, try to imagine what Scripture is saying here. It's actually very comical, if you can think of this. If the ear would say, because I'm not an ear, not an eye, I'm not part of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? 20. But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which it lacks, that there should be no schism, division, no schism in the body, but that the members should, not, should have the same care for one another. For if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. If we reflect on this text this morning, Paul compares the church to the human body. And as we read earlier, the human body is so intricately made where each part has a role to play. Just like that, in the church, we too individually play an essential part. The church functions the same way as the human body it functions as long as all the parts are in place, where all the limbs are in place, then the church can be used according to the manner God has prepared her. God designed the church so that it can function with the same precision as the human body. Now, I'm going to unpack these verses as we go along this morning. And there are four calls I would like to make out this morning. Four calls. And I wonder who among us will answer these calls. The first call I see here is a call to unite. If you look at verse 12 to 14 and then verse 25, the scriptures talk about one body with many members. I mean, we don't have two, three, five, ten bodies. One body, the church. If this church is one body, just like our human body, we should take care of it. And we don't have two, three, four bodies. If you, be, if you belong to this local church, this is your body. And we have a responsibility, you and I, to take care of the church, the body. And when we do that, we keep the church healthy. Now, we also note here, just like there's one body, there are many members. The human body, there are eyes, there are ears and nose and so on. And in the church too, there are many different types of members. And all members are joined in unity. The arms don't do its own thing. The legs don't kind of, you know, like if I'm walking this way, my arm won't kind of go that way. Now, the body, each member is called. Think of when you have a cut. Um, if you uh, cut your skin and there is, there is, uh, it's exposed to the elements, what happens with your body? Think about it for a moment. When you get a cut, your body knows to send the right uh, blood cells to patch the cut. If there is not enough blood cells, you would bleed to death. If there is too much clotting, it would obstruct the flow of blood and you could die. Now imagine you're seriously injured and the part of the body that controls blood clotting was not functioning, you might die. Imagine if your hands and your arms are not working, you won't be able to pick up a bandage. 
Suppose your mouth, you can't speak, then you can't call out for help. Even a simple cut can be life-threatening if a human body doesn't work together. Similarly, just like there are different parts of the human body that requires it to work together, the church too has many members. And if all the members don't work together in cohesion, it's going to damage the church. The text here calls for unity, but unity in diversity. We are all different, just like the different parts of the body have a different role to play. We too have a different role. We have many different gifts here, but one spirit. Many members, but one church. The text doesn't call us to be uniform. We are not called to be uniform. You're not supposed to be the same as the person next to you. We are all different, we are all diverse, but in our diversity, do we come together as one body, supporting and encouraging each other for the glory of God? Perhaps uh, we may say then we have our differences, we can unite, but uh, we don't really know one another. Um, no, but, but the text here calls us in the midst of our differences, in the midst of our different backgrounds, can you come together as brothers and sisters? If you really want to get to know someone, one of the things you can do is talk to their children. If you talk to their children, they will uh, kind of begin to reveal to you who the parents are at home. Now, my daughter uh, at school, uh, when she was really young, um, the class teacher asked her, you know, who are your parents? So she said, my, my, my mother is Fiona, that's my wife, and my father is Shrek. Fiona and Shrek. She said that without a blink of an eye. Um, but if you... Uh, I just imagine going to meet the class teacher. Hi, Fiona and Mr. Shrek. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, but if you actually know, if you kind of follow the Shrek series, uh, the Sh not only is the Shrek an org, ultimately Fiona too was an org. And, uh, and uh, that kind of levels the playing field. And this text as well calls us to level the playing field. Take a look at verse 13 with me. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether you're a Shrek or a human. No, I mean, whether you are Jew or Gentile, whether slave or free, whether you are Sinhalese or Tamils, whether you are a maid or a CEO, whether you have a job or your Homeless, we have been all made to drink into one spirit. We are one body. And that is a great kind of, it kind of, no, it brings us all onto the same level field. We are on the same ground. Whatever we bring, uh, before we knew Jesus, whatever we bring to him, he wipes it clean. It doesn't really matter what your background is. It doesn't really matter what kind of family upbringing you have. It doesn't really matter what your race is or how old you are. God accepts us as we are and we too are called to accept each other. You know, our country our recent, say, 50 years has so much racial strife. How do you apply this text to such a context? As believers, we can look at somebody who is different to us through the eyes of love. We don't see their racial or financial or social status, that kind of background, but we look at them. Can we see them through the eyes of Jesus, through the eyes of the Father? They are precious in His sight. 
made in his image. Do we see people like that? But this text calls us to the same level field. This morning, as I send out a call to unity, call to be united, do you discriminate? Do I discriminate? Other genders? Different racial groups? People who can't speak English, perhaps. Or someone who's poor. Someone's begging across the road who asks for money. Do you and I discriminate against them based on their social standing? Or anything else that differs us from ourselves? Perhaps if you bring that here among us, when we are called to be united together, do we have grudges against each other? I mean, there could be somebody sitting right behind you with whom you have a personal grudge. Do you compare with one another what you have and what they have? Are you a divider, my brothers and sisters? Are you a divider this morning or are you a unifier? What kind of aroma or fragrance do you bring into this body? Do you, are you someone who brings people together and builds up the church with unity and with love? And that is what God is calling us to this morning as the call goes out to be united. Are you a divider? Or do you bring unity? We have all as different types of people come together. We have all kinds of problems. We bring all kinds of baggage. And perhaps, how should we respond when we have all kinds of issues that are going on in each other's life, in the life of the church? You know, someone said that there is no perfect church. If you do find the perfect church, please don't join it because you're going to ruin it. So in the midst of all the problems, are you going to be that problem solver? Will you bring unity to the church? Verses 15 to 26, there's another call. Call to serve. If you reflect on these verses, all members are called. These verses, I mean, requires not just myself preaching, not the ushers who are kind of, you know, kind of guiding you or the ones who are welcoming you or the worship team. All are required to serve. Every single one of you are necessary. The Bible talk, call, talks about the priesthood of believers where everyone has a role. What is your role? What is your function in the church? Please ponder upon it. I pray the Holy Spirit would touch your heart even this morning and guide you to open yourself. Ask the Holy Spirit, why am I here? We don't have any bench warmers. You know, bench warmers and, you know, in a sports team, they come and they sit on the bench to warm the bench. We don't have bench warmers in the Christian church. There was a story told about a rich man who was building a church in a village. And he built a beautiful building, uh, very grand with nice chairs and uh, nice interior. And when they began to start the services, there was no lights. Uh, different families came and there were no lights. So what the rich man did was he gave each of the families a lantern. So when they came to church, they brought the lantern with them. And as each of the families sat in different areas of the church, the church lit up. And when some of the families were absent, there was darkness in those areas. My friends, God has given us a light. Each one of you and myself, we have a light. 
And when you are not here, there's darkness on your seat. We are all called to play a part. We all have a role. So if you ask me what that role is, let's try to figure it out even this morning. Perhaps some may feel they are, they suffer actually two different, uh, um, uh, two different problems that might stop them from serving. One is, I call it an inferiority complex. And the second is a superiority complex. I'll tell you what I mean by this. If you look at verse 15 to 17 with me quickly. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the ears should say, because I'm not an eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? So we, if you feel like you are a ear. Can a body function without a ear? Without a nose? I mean, no way. But, we, but perhaps you may feel like uh, you don't have much to offer. And you feel, um, you feel that perhaps you're not needed. But in reality, all parts of the human body is required to make the human body what it is. Have you ever had a time where you knocked your pinky toe? Why do you need a pinky toe? Have you knocked your pinky toe on a, on a bed or on a shelf on the wall? And what happened? Did it hurt you? I have one family member, I won't uh, mention who the person is, always um, gets the person's uh, pinky toe knocked onto things and, and all the rolls over in pain. Once almost fractured the pinky toe. Can we cut the pinky toe out? Why do you need a pinky toe? So small, so insignificant it seems. Can we cut it? If you cut your pinky toe, you'll have a hard time walking. Hard time balancing. You have to retrain yourself to walk if you don't have the pinky toe. Even the pinky toe has an essential part to play in the human body. So I don't know what you think your role is, but whatever that role is, it is essential, essential to the proper functioning of the church. Just like it balances the human body, your contribution brings in a light in a certain area of the church, and we require your participation. Perhaps the inferiority complex can operate in this manner. Maybe there could be some one or a couple of people who would like a certain role. You feel like... Uh, this is the role I want to get. If I don't get that role of function, I'm not going to take part in the body of Christ. Or there is somebody else functioning in that capacity. So I don't want to do anything in the church. Let's look at verse 18. 18 and 22. But now, God has said the members, God is the one who's placing you and I into different places. Each one of them in the body just as he is pleased. If we believe that God is sovereign, if we believe that God is in control, if we believe that the God I spoke of who controls, who knows when we lie down and when we wake up, the God who knows the care on our head, he knows what we are doing in church. And he does that in verse 22, as he pleases, God places different people as he pleases. God has placed you and I. God arranges, God chooses. God has given you a gift and a role. To reject that is to say that 
God, you don't know what you're doing. So are you willing this morning to answer God's call as He calls you to serve? How do you find your role in the body? I mean, there are general guidelines. Why you could try to figure out what your spiritual gifting is. Um, Corinthians earlier and later on, that particular chapter talks about gifts. We can do a gift test. Perhaps you could have a natural giftedness. There are certain areas you feel like you have certain strengths and certain weaknesses. So those can be one of the guides. Perhaps passion. I mean, naturally God has given us a certain desire for certain things. I mean, if you, lie, if you, are, um, if you have a heart that goes out to people who are on the street, perhaps God is calling you to start a ministry towards those people. So what area has God given what, what passion has God given you? What desires has He given you? Then you can get confirmation from others as you move in your ministry areas. For some, we just have to try it out. We are not God. We don't exactly know what, perhaps, you know, what areas you want, you know, God is calling you to. But are you willing to try it out? Are you willing to take steps of faith even if you don't know all the answers? It's like developing a muscle. The more we practice or the more we exercise, we build up a muscle. Similarly, as we move out in faith and you begin to serve and minister in different areas as God leads you, God can develop those areas. But first, you got to move out. You got to get out of the bench. If you don't get off the bench, you will not even experience the possibility of God using you and using myself. So are you willing to serve? And as a start, I encourage you to serve in the area of giftedness, where you feel God has given you certain gifts. But God is God and He can do anything He wants. Think of Moses. God calls Moses you know, through a burning bush in the Old Testament to be a leader in front of his people. And he complains, God, I don't, I can't speak in front of people. I'm so afraid. I stutter and so on. And then he brought Aaron along. But although he brought Aaron along, Moses still had to fulfill the plan God had for him. So what, what is God calling you to do this morning? If we are faithful in the little things, God will bless those little faithful acts and He will multiply it. So this morning, even if you feel like you have very little to contribute, can I ask you, my friends, are you willing to take those little steps of faith? Step out and serve in the area God is calling you as you have a stirring in your heart. Perhaps for some of us, we don't serve because we have a superiority complex. Take a look at verse 21. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. So you see, my friends, when we display a sense of independence, we cannot fully be part of what God is doing in the church. Perhaps a root cause might be pride. It's prideful to think like this, that we don't need one another. If you look at the Bible and study the number of one another verses, there's so many one another verses in the Bible. Love one another, pray for one another. How can you do that if you don't fully participate in the life of the church? You can't. And pride, my friends. God resists the proud. As simple as that. I'm just quoting scripture. God 
resist the proud. And if you want to be resisted by God Almighty, my friends, do you want to be in that position? I certainly do not. If we meditate on these verses, what is your role? What is your function? Will you answer the call this morning, the call to serve? Perhaps in new areas, perhaps in the old areas, the recommitment. Are you willing to step out and serve God and the church? Verse 26. And if one member suffers, all members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all members rejoice with it. We are made for community. We are made, we, are, we actually belong to one another. How can we fulfill this verse? Verse 26. How can we rejoice with one another or suffer with one another if we don't spend time with each other? If something great is happening in one of your lives, how can we celebrate with you if you don't spend time in smaller fellowships? Actually, this larger gathering is difficult to get to know people. We encourage our church members to stay back. But can we perhaps think of your small groups, your family groups? These are ideal places where you can rejoice with one another. You can suffer with one another. We cannot fulfill verse 26 as lone Christians. And if you think you're a lone Christian, no, I can do it myself. How can you fulfill verse 26? The body of Christ is not an organization. It's an organ. It, it, it is an organism. So that's a difference. Now, for example, if I'm going to make a table, I take pieces of wood, I make the legs, I make the top, I organize it according to some kind of plan, I nail it together, and it's a table. But we can't do the same thing with a human body. Can you take parts of a human body and stitch it together? No way. The same thing with the church. So it's dynamic, it's moving, it's changing. Perhaps one of the reasons why we don't feel like we want to belong to one another is we've had past hurts, perhaps uh, betrayals, disloyalty, and these past hurts comes from not from outside but from within. Will you answer the call to engage, to build up the community? Will you answer the call to belong, to belong to one another? Whatever hurts you have gone, gone through, can we bring love and forgiveness? And let the world see whatever hurts we've been going through, that we can overcome it through the love of Christ. And then the world will know our God is real, our God is alive. There's a final call that goes out. Verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Verse 13. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. My friends, the final call is the final call to Christ. To know Him, to be baptized in His name, to be filled with the Spirit as you do so. Christ is the head of the body. He is the access door. He is the ticket. We don't have multiple ways. We see here it's one Spirit, one body, one church. I wish I could say that many parts would lead you there. But according to Scripture, that's not the case. Jesus states, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No one enters the Father except through me. This is words of Jesus. But someone who states, I am the way, the truth, and the life, you can't call him a good teacher, my friends. If he's lying to you, you can't call him a good teacher or a prophet. I mean, he states very clearly, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You can either accept it or reject it. And Jesus is calling out to you this morning, my friends. Now, in our life, we worship something. We idolize something. If you don't idolize and worship God, you could be worshiping and idolizing your spouse, your girlfriend, your children, your work, your career, a dream you might have. We worship something in our lives. And when you do worship an idol, by idol what I mean is something not of God. If you worship an idol, you become like an idol. If you worship a statue, for example, you become like a statue. Habakkuk 2 and Psalm 115 proclaims that. Perhaps we may feel that we've been idolizing for many, many years. We've been falling down at the altar of whatever you want to call it, perhaps could be something sort of accepted, maybe like your children. It could be perhaps an idol of sex, idol of drugs. The day of reckoning is coming, my friends. And it may not be, it, you may not have to wait until you meet the Creator. Think of Bill Cosby. I don't know whether you've been reading the news. Bill Cosby. I, mean, I used to What's the Cosby show growing up? Emery Carr's dad. Such a happy family, right? In jail now. 81 years old. Jail. Who would have thought? And we hear story after story of how he idolized women and with drugs and sex and so on. There is a day of reckoning coming. What got him there? How should we respond to him? Shall we take our stones? Ready? Let's take our stones to stone him? Shall we stone Cosby? Guilty? Clearly guilty. Shall we stone him? To be honest, as we raise our stones to stone him, there is a little Bill Cosby living in my heart and living in your heart. The Cosby is inside you. The Bible declares that if he lost someone, one time, one time, You have committed adultery. I have committed adultery. So you don't have to sleep with a woman. If you lust, I'm guilty. You are guilty. Cosby lives in us. Rotting in a Russian prison cell, Alexander Sosa Nixon declares the thin line between good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart. The thin line between good and evil passes in your heart and it passes in my heart, my friends. God has told us the fundamental problem with man is his heart. The Bible <laughs> declares our heart as twisted, almost demonic. Bible calls it sin. 
And we try to cover it up, my friends. I mean, religious acts. Go to church service or we do serve, you know, worship or whatever you want to call it. Religious acts. Isaiah 64 declares all our religious acts are like filthy rags. Because God's standard is higher than our standards. His way of thinking is higher than our way of thinking. We can't fool God with a religious performance. Perhaps if it's not religion, it's perhaps education. We think maybe if you educate our youth, young people, they will stop. They will reduce at least pornography or maybe sharing messages, nude messages. Perhaps the drug culture. Maybe education is the answer. D.L. Moody, the great American evangelist, once said, if a man is stealing nuts and bolts from a railway track, and in order to change him, you send him to college, at the end of his education, he will steal the whole railway track. <laughs> 